Brianna, what's on your radar? Well, I admit it. I was skeptical at first, but it's getting to the point where if I were a betting woman, I bet it all on Biden not running for a second term in 2024. Now, I feel like my former skepticism was well-founded. The pull of incumbency is powerful. Only five presidents ever have declined to run for a second term. James Polk, president from 1845 to 1849, ran on the promise that he would not run for re-election. He ran on four specific goals, two of which were annexing Oregon and snatching California from Mexico. He achieved all four goals within four years, kept his word, and did not run again. Rutherford B. Hayes made a similar promise to be a one-term president and fulfilled it. James Buchanan managed to get on the wrong side of both Republican abolitionists and Northern Democrats in those touchy pre-Civil War years and simply opted out of the drama. Calvin Coolidge became president after Warren Harding's death in office and had already served six years at the end of his first term. He opted out of his second term because, in addition to weathering the loss of his young son, he felt that 10 years for a president was just too long. And similarly, LBJ felt that six years were enough after serving out half of JFK's term and facing public outrage over the Vietnam War. He simply opted out. Of those five former presidents, only three served neat four-year terms. And two of those three ran and were elected on the condition of being a one-term president. As if Biden were to step down, it would represent an outlier case. And it wouldn't just be historically aberrant, it would be a departure from Biden's character. Joe Biden is a man who has run for president three times. He was elected to the Senate at age 29 and has been grasping at the Oval for as long as I've been alive. This is not a man who I ever imagined would give up on that Tony 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue address without a fight. But Biden's unprecedented age, and more importantly, his visible decline since the Obama years, immediately gave rise to speculation that he would be a one-term president, even during the primary. Although 2020 has been largely memory hold, the question of Biden's physical and mental stamina was raised briefly by a couple of Democratic primary candidates. Remember this? They do not have to buy in. They do not have to buy in. You just said that. You just said that two minutes ago. You just said two minutes ago that they would have to buy in. You said they would have to buy in. to buy in. If she qualifies for Are you forgetting what you said two minutes ago? You said just two minutes ago? I mean, I can't believe that you said two minutes ago that they had to buy in, and now you're saying they don't have to buy. You're forgetting that. <laughs> now, the Democratic Party seems to have put the kibosh on that line of attack, protecting the man who seemed likely to be the chosen establishment pick, but not before Castro got a little support from Cory Booker. There are Do you want to see moments where you listen to Joe Biden and you just wonder? I think that we are at a tough point right now because there's a lot of people who are concerned about uh, Joe Biden's ability to carry the ball all the way across the end line without fumbling. And I think that Castro has some really uh, legitimate concerns about can he be someone in a long, grueling campaign uh, that can get the ball over the line? And he has every right to call that out. Uh, for his trouble, by the way, Booker was out by the next debate and Castro was done by the debate after that. No one puts Biden in a corner. <laughs> but while it was considered uncouth to discuss Biden's longevity back in 2019, now it seems that Democrats are very conspicuously going out of their way not to answer whether or not they would support a Biden run in 2024. Here's Cori Bush ducking the question last week. Do you want to see Joe Biden run for a second term? She's got to go. Yeah, I, you know. Uh, that's an easy question. It's not going to take long. Do you want to see Joe I, Biden? I don't want to answer that question because we have not, that's not, yeah, I don't want to answer that question. Okay. Um, I mean, he's the president and he has the right to to run for a second term. Absolutely. That's good. Right but I don't want to, wanna, I don't, yeah. I don't want, I'd rather you not do that. Okay, answer so you got like two minutes to be in the car. Yeah, I know. Uh, I got to get to the. Well, thanks very much. The other thing. Do you want to see Joe Biden run for a second term? <laughs> what yeah. an answer. Like, if I asked my boyfriend, am I a good cook? And he replied, you certainly have the right to cook. <laughs> I'd consider hanging up my apron. Now, Cori Bush isn't the only one. Earlier this week, two top Democratic Congress members declined to say whether Biden should run in 2024. Unlike Bush's, uh, Bush's remarks, comments of this sort from establishment Dems, Carolyn Maloney and Jerry Nadler, couldn't be dismissed as just salty, progressive peak. 
During a debate between the two Congress members, who, due to redistricting, are both running for the same seat now, Nadler answered that it was too early to say and that it doesn't serve the purpose of the Democratic Party to deal with that until after midterms. That's a line I've been hearing a lot from Democratic Party insiders, including the Pod Save America crew. It's a discussion for after midterms. Maloney was more blunt, saying, quote, I don't believe he's running for re-election. And this is Joe Manchin just this past Tuesday. Let me ask you to expand on something you were discussing with Chuck Todd on Meet the Press on Sunday, where you said that you, well, you did not say whether you would back Democrats in the midterms, and you said you would decide based on individual candidates, I think. Uh, would you support Joe Biden if he's on the ticket in 2024 as the Democratic president Andrew, seeking let me, re-election? Let, let me make it very, very clear. This is the most, one of the most important pieces of legislation in my lifetime that we've ever done to have energy security, to fight inflation, to help our geopolitical well, allies you, around the world. And you've worked with the Democratic and White I'm, House on it. And, and that's exactly, and I'm working with it. I'm very appreciative. They are. But for me to bring the politics into it, oh, this is a Democrat bill. Oh, this is an anti-Republican bill. This is not. I'm not talking about the 2022 election and 2024. I have no control over those elections. And I'm not going to talk about them that will skew one of the greatest pieces of legislation. And I'm very appreciative that the president has seen it. He's approved it. He supports it. God bless him for that. This is great for America. Yeah. Can't we do something for our country without having to well, bring politics into it? Well, you're, That's you're all I'm not going to talk about. You're a I'm Democratic not senator. About it. I'm, just, I'm just asking I'm you whether you would support your it. own, the leader of your own I'm party. I'm talking about I'm supporting this bill, Andrea. Talk about a filibuster. Now, this postural whiplash after years of Democrats insisting that there's nothing to see here when it comes to Biden's ability to lead the country amounts to a blinking vague sign saying he's out, folks. Now, of course, this has provoked a whole host of op-eds about who the Democratic presidential candidate will be. Latest among them is Michael Starr Hopkins' op-ed at The Hill, which argues that AOC is the Democrats' best shot against Trump in 2024. Starr cites AOC's ability to relate to her supporters and the simplicity with which she talks about everyday struggles, as well as her independence from corporate money and ability to raise huge sums through grassroots fundraising. She isn't afraid to lose, he writes, and Democrats want a fighter, not a politician, someone who punches back and isn't afraid to say what they mean. But is that person AOC? It remains to be seen whether progressives trust her enough to pick up the progressive mantle dropped by Bernie at the end of his 2020 campaign. Although mainstream liberal coverage of AOC has consistently praised her poise, her fluency on evolving cultural issues, and her viral callouts of the establishment, a not insignificant portion of the left has been mounting substantive criticisms of AOC since the end of the Bernie campaign. First came unconfirmed rumors that she had distanced herself from Bernie after his campaign touted a soft endorsement by popular podcaster Joe Rogan. When AOC was first elected, progressives cheered her choice to protest with climate youths in Nancy Pelosi's office. But the week she was sworn in for her second term, well, that news week was marred somewhat by her dismissive response to a grassroots campaign aimed at pushing progressive House members to not vote for Nancy Pelosi to be Speaker of the House, at least not without getting something in return. The narrow margins in the House meant that the squad had the power to keep the third most powerful Democrat in the country out of her leadership seat. And many progressives, including myself, Crystal Ball, Cornel West, Jimmy Dore, Chris Hedges, and Katie Halper among them, saw this as one of the last opportunities to extract anything for working people before Biden's brand of neoliberal do-nothingness set in. She and other squad members declined to participate, insisting that political capital would be better spent over the fight for 15. And we all know how the fight for 15 went. AOC fought valiantly to keep the Build Back Better bill from being bifurcated, predicting, rightly, that corporatists in both parties would throw the human infrastructure bill that provided substantive relief for American families under the bus. But she declined to call out progressive caucus leader Pramila Jayapal for pressuring her caucus not to use their leverage to keep the incredibly popular $15 minimum wage in the American Rescue Plan. And although Nancy Pelosi literally made AOC cry on the House floor as she leaned on her to vote for additional Iron Dome funding for Israel, 
AOC has yet to call Pelosi out as an enemy of working people's interests. AOC has been criticized for taking a number of votes that are out of step with her professed anti-war beliefs, including voting for military aid to Ukraine. She also gave vague answers when asked about her support for Julian Assange in December of 2020. That's something Marjorie Taylor Greene picked up on recently in her criticism of AOC. And who can forget how AOC's 2021 Met Gala dress became a Rorschach test, dividing the entire internet. Now, certainly AOC has a long list of accomplishments under her belt as well. And compared to most of the other names being bandied about to replace Biden, she's an obvious star. But these past two years have been a litmus test for many progressives who are deciding not between progressive candidates or even Democratic centrists, but whether to invest in electoral politics at all. 2018 proved that progressives can win, but 2021 showed how disappointing they can be once they're in Congress. If progressives weren't willing to pull a mansion, to use the narrow margins in the House to vote as a block and hold up must-pass legislation until the corporate duopoly finally served the public, why should the public invest in electing more squad members? Why should they trust a squad member for president? These are the questions that AOC, Ro Connor, and any other progressive hopeful will have to answer. Now, certainly, many Democratic voters and progressives still hold a positive view of AOC, perhaps the majority of them. But her favorability polls tell a more ambiguous story. 35% of respondents in a May poll found her to be favorable or somewhat favorable. 33% had an unfavorable view of AOC, with another 9% finding her somewhat unfavorable. Now, this isn't an exact science, but what I think you're seeing here is that AOC isn't quite the Bernie-style figure Starr thinks she is. Bernie's favorability rating is 44% favorable or somewhat favorable. And whereas even his detractors think he's an honest broker, AOC is plagued by claims that her progressivism is largely performative. Should she have worn the dress? Should she have kept her hands behind her back when she was escorted away from an abortion protest last month, despite not being handcuffed? Will she be willing to take a stand against Pelosi the way Sanders has historically stood against the establishment? Now, Senator Sanders is not immune from criticisms from the left, but unlike AOC, Bernie's long record has earned him more benefit of the doubt, rightly or wrongly. If AOC does choose to run, can she be successful without the support of the independent left media, which is currently divided on the question of whether there's any point in voting for any Democrats at all? Now, I covered AOC's first day in Congress, the protest at Pelosi's office, as a journalist for The Intercept. I interviewed her later that year at South by Southwest and found her to be one of the most agile and principled speakers I'd had the pleasure of ever interviewing at the time. My journalism career had started with the critique of how identity politics had been weaponized by the Democratic Party in these really insidious ways that actually hurt the groups they claimed to be wanting to protect. And AOC's willingness to join in on that critique and even expand on it was impressive to me, especially back in 2018, 2019, when Democrats were deeply invested in the idea that demographic changes, not policy, were the salvation of the party. That's why I do believe that AOC has the capacity to be an extraordinary presidential candidate someday, but only if she returns to the politics that got her elected principled, broad, accessible language that sounded more Bernie than Barnard College, only if she avoids the trappings of a corporate media infrastructure that validates some of her worst instincts and couldn't care less about the working people which got her in this game to begin with. If Biden indeed does not run, progressives will certainly be looking for a bannerman. And I promise you, his name is not Mayor Pete. The mantle is there for AOC to pick up, but first she'll have to prove to progressives that she's more leftist than Democrat. And I'm so glad you're here for this, Katie, because few people have been on this journey and been playing inside baseball with the left uh, the way that you have. What do you think of this, this idea that it could, be, it could be AOC? I mean, I think that I basically uh, co-sign what you said. And I think that unlike Bernie, who, you know, one of the most appealing things about Bernie is that, as you mentioned, Everyone, most people who are remotely honest, who have any ethical bones in their body, know the guy's honest mm -hmm. and means what he says and is consistent. I think you're right that AOC has some catch up to do in terms of policy, consistency, and principle. 
Uh, I think that, you know, she, obviously she's much younger. Uh, I think that we'll have to see what happens. What, what do you think? I mean, who wants to look? I, I want to entertain it because yeah. the bench is shallow. Yeah. The de Democratic bench broadly is shallow, and as a leftist who has, I would argue, a slightly higher litmus test, <laughs> it's even shallower than that. And I do, like I said, I think that she has a lot of things going for her. I was, you know, a huge supporter of her and followed her career very closely. I was basically on the AOC beat at The Intercept uh, for the first year it, that I worked in this milieu. But it's hard for me not to observe these kinds of shifts. And I am like, I feel like Tyra Banks. I'm rooting for her. I'm rooting for her. But it's not entirely clear to me she that she has She has a work, uh, the uh, crossover appeal with sort of like working class people who liked that. Bernie and then Trump in a, a way that is clearly personality based. Absolutely I think. not. Right. She yeah. clearly, I think she could. Be she a, could. But yeah. she doesn't. Be a she Currently. Have to, she'd have to make some adjustments. It, it yeah. feels to me like she's been in a world, an immediate infrastructure that really does validate the bad instincts, the instincts to say, I'm going to, I didn't like the dress. I'm sorry. I confess. This, right. this, I don't, I didn't take it to be this horrible thing that right. some people did, but I, I thought it was a bad political move to wear the dress to the Met Gala. I don't think it's a good political move to take some of the, to lean into some of the, the academic language, the stuff approach. like it's that, that sort of approach. thing. Yeah. Yeah. And if it's a one-off, I wouldn't mind yeah. it. But I think in the aggregate, she has aligned herself with a lot of the kind of neoliberal interests that put us off of those kind of politicians to begin with. Can she claw it back? I'd love to see I it. Will, I will say, like you, I am now resistant, uh, uh, reluctantly coming around to an idea I was resistant toward initially that Biden might not run again. I, I really thought that was yeah. kind of crazy thinking, and I'm hearing it from enough people, yeah. enough credible people, I'm not sure. Yeah. All right, we'll have more rising right after this. Stay with us.